Hello and welcome to the first video of the Unemployed Workers Union's online advocacy course and this video is called The Need for Advocacy and basically I'm going to, here I'm going to summarise just the historical perspective of the Australian government's treatment of unemployed workers, how we got here and provide a bit of analysis as to why the government wants to treat unemployed workers in this way. Why does the government want to be so punitive when it comes to the treatment of unemployed, which I think is a very, very important question and a question that isn't often um, understood or, or even asked by people in this area. So well, I'll get straight into it and first and foremost, I'll to provide a bit of a background, I'll give you an idea of where we are right now in Australia and here I, I've, the, the Unemployed Workers Union has identified four crises that are happening at the moment, four major crises that are happening. The first crisis is the lack of jobs. I mean, this is the elephant in the room. Very, very rarely is it understood or spoken about how many people are competing for job amongst themselves for the very few jobs that are available in the Australian labour market. So this graph here shows that there are about 18, 19 job seekers competing amongst themselves for every listed job vacancy. The data here is taken from the Australian Bureau of Statistics and to reach this um, figure, um, the Unemployed Workers Union research team has taken the amount of underemployed people, the amount of unemployed people and the amount of hidden unemployed people, all counted by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, and we've compared that to the amount of job vacancies currently available um, going by the Department of Employment's um, data. And as you can see, it's a huge crisis, and it's a crisis that's gotten a lot worse in only about five years. It, it went from about being eight job seekers competing for every job vacancy to about 18 in the space of seven, eight years. So it's, um, it, it, that, that is the major crisis, really, that's affecting unemployed workers, their inability to find work and, and get that, that support they need through, um, through regular employment. The second graph I want to show you, just to give a little bit more um, background here is, and give you the historical perspective, is that the average duration of unemployment. It's um, This era we're in at the moment is, is, is quite new, where unemployment is, is quite a long-term phenomenon. Um, it didn't used to be that way, and it's changed in, in recent years. And as you can see from this graph, the average duration of unemployment, which is taken from the average duration of um, people in receipt of New Start. It's gone from essentially being uh, very, very close to to maybe about a few months there. It's it's very, very close to zero on that graph, but it would be roughly a few months in 1967 to being around about 220 weeks, which is essentially four and a half years. That's the average duration of people receiving the New Start entitlement. That, that data was taken from 2013, so it's quite possible and I think very likely that it's gotten worse since then. This next graph is the second major crisis that unemployed workers face every day, which is the complete lack of the unemployment entitlement known as New Start. As you can see from this graph, um, the New Start rate currently is about 35 percent um, below the poverty line and that's that's a figure that's in money terms it's about $380 per fortnight below the poverty line that's what that that figure represents and it's, it it has decreased a lot um, in a very short space of time it went from being around about level with the poverty line in the late 80s to being substantially higher than the poverty line, about 10% higher than the poverty line in the early 90s, and then it's just completely free from from then on to being around about 30-35% below the poverty line. And this data was taken by the, um, the Australian Institute and was taken from figures that they got from the, um, the, the Melbourne Institute, which they, they collect um, quarterly data about the, the Henderson poverty line, which is, we believe, the most reliable measure of, of, of poverty. 
The next crisis um, is the punitive Centrelink system. Uh, this system has been created to make collecting a social security payment the most humiliating and degrading experience possible. And this takes many different forms, um, it goes across many different payments. For example, um, the disability support pension is, is a payment that's been completely under assault over the last few years. When the coalition government came into power in about in 2013, um, roughly one third of DSP applications were accepted. Um, now, within just three years, that is halved to about 15%. So that's a huge amount of people being denied the disability support pension who, who really desperately need it. And of course, a lot of these people are being forced onto New Start, and that system is completely insufficient and they're being abused by job agencies not having their medical conditions recognised, which is a massive issue that we're, we're seeing happen on the ground. The single parent pension as well has been something that's been massively slimmed down over the past decade or so under the, the, the Gillard government. Around 100,000, um, I, I believe, single parents were pushed off the single parent pension and put onto New Start with the changing of eligibility. And over the last few years, we've just seen so many different attacks being waged against Social Security recipients. There's been the, the debt crisis where hundreds of thousands of fraudulent debt letters have been sent out to people on Social Security. There's the income management programs that are being expanded under the current budget. There's the, the mandatory drug testing, which the government are trying to introduce. The, the government are also trying to double the asset waiting period for people getting on the dole. Um, and there's also a very, very sneaky attack in this current budget where the government want to make it so you can only get back pay from your um, the date that you first applied for the dole you, you're, you're only able to get back pay to that date once you've submitted a full application. Unlike the previous system, you got back pay to when you made your claim and then you submitted the documents over time. Under this new system the government wanted to introduce, you only get back pay from the date you submit all documents. And as many people know, when you deal with Centrelink, it can be very difficult to get all documents in, and particularly when Centrelink often lose documents. So this is a very, very big attack where people trying to apply on the dole have to get all their paperwork in order right then and there and they have to make sure Centrelink don't lose that paperwork in order for them to get back paid up until that date because as I'm sure a lot of people would know it takes a long time for Centrelink to process these claims and you only get paid at the time that they finish processing it. Um, and another major attack is how difficult it is to actually contact Centrelink and the, the data is quite shocking here. The latest data shows that 42 million um, calls to Centrelink went unanswered in in the, in the financial year, which is just a complete failure of a social security system. You can't contact the social security system, then that social security system is broken. And this has all been very deliberate. Um, the CPSU, which is the union responsible for Centrelink workers, has been campaigning quite strongly on getting more staff at Centrelink and have been stating that there have been 5,000 staff cut from Centrelink and related services within about a five-year period, which is a huge reduction in staff. When you consider the growing population and the, the more calls being made to Centrelink every year, that's a huge attack on, on the ability of that social security system to, to do what it's meant to do. It seems like that they're paving the Centrelink system they're paving the way for the privatisation of the Centrelink system. And just, just to sum that all up, this recent budget has cut a total of $3.4 billion from the Social Security budget, which is a clear attack on people living on Social Security. The next major crisis is the punitive job agency system. This is where the Unemployed Workers Union do, do the most of its work, which is trying to help people deal with this very, very punitive job agency system where system that job, unemployed workers have no other place to turn. There's, there's nowhere else for them to go because the government haven't provided any service for people trying to deal with job agencies. There's no one you can call, no government-funded body that can help you deal with job agencies, which is one of the reasons why the Unemployed Workers Union has 
set up a hotline, set up its advocacy service to fill that gap. So to give you a bit of an idea on what's happening now, this graph is very shocking. It just gives you an idea of how punitive the system has become in a very short period of time. So in the late 80s, the job agency system was state-run, was, was, was run by the, the, the federal government, and that system was called the Commonwealth Employment Service. And as you can see, under that system, there was very few penalties. 1989, there's, there's barely there's, there's such a small amount that it's difficult to see. I think it's around about 10,000 penalties were imposed in 1989. And then as time went on, um, the, the Labor government at the time wanted to start increasing the requirements placed on people accepting the, the doll. And as they increased the requirements, there was more penalties. So in 1995, there was a slight increase. In 1997, a slight increase. But in that year, 1997, it's a crucial year. That's when the Commonwealth Employment Service was privatised by the Howard government. And that that was part of a struggle that was going on between the government, both Labor and Liberal, the Labor and Coalition governments. They, they wanted the Commonwealth Employment Service to punish more unemployed workers. And there's documents stating that the government had a quota of, of penalties that it wanted to be imposed and the Commonwealth Employment Service was run by people who were very very highly qualified and they understood the labour market and they understood the realities that there weren't enough jobs to go around so a lot of Commonwealth Employment Service staff simply refused to penalise people because they didn't agree with it ethically and the union fought that battle with the government throughout the, the late 80s and throughout the early 90s and it got to a quite an aggressive position where the government was trying to undermine the union power at these Commonwealth Employment Service offices. And in, in the end, they managed to break down the union and simply privatise the entire employment services service or the Commonwealth Employment Services um, agency. And then after that happened, then we start to see a massive in, increase in the amount of penalties. In, in 2000, the penalties increased about three or four times. And then Gradually since then, there's been more increases under the private system, more increases in the types of activities that what, that unemployed workers were forced to attend, appointments, um, their, their, their job search and, and work for the doll, which was also introduced at, in 1997. So there was a range of other activities that unemployed workers had to attend and had to participate in in order to get the doll. And that was one of the reasons why I think we see such a huge increase in penalties and as we'll go through later in this course, also just the amount of illegality that goes on with this private industry has, has really um, led to a huge increase in penalties. And just from 2010 to 2015, that's about an eight, eight times increase in penalties. It went from about 300,000 penalties to 2.1 million penalties in five years, which is completely shocking and it's something that isn't isn't really talked about and that's that's one of the things that we're going to be focusing on today and the amount of misery and suffering that occurs as a result of this this, this punitive system is um is, is something that really just the mind boggles to, to think about all that suffering that occurs because of this system so that's what the unemployed workers union is mostly trying to fight against this punitive system and what i will be arguing today is that the, the contracts which regulate the system, um, actually encourage job agencies to penalise people. And they put job agencies in a position where there's perverse incentives for them to penalise people, which is why under the new Job Active contract, which was introduced in 2015, we see such a huge increase in penalties being imposed on unemployed workers. It's worth noting also that, that, that the CDP, which is the, <clears throat> the, the job agency system in remote areas, which is mostly in Aboriginal areas, that's where we see the most amount of, of penalties going on. If, you, if you're on the CDP, you're 70 times more likely to be penalised um, than anybody else in a, in a non-CDB CDB program. But the next graph um, is just the total proportion of, of, of penalties. So that the penalties as a proportion of total unemployed gives, gives an idea that these, this increase of penalties isn't just because the amount of unemployed has been increasing, it's because 
there's just been a huge increase in penalties. I mean, going by this this data um, that we've collected, every unemployed person in 2015, on average, would be penalised two and a half times. Compare that to 1989, when, as as the the previous graph showed, there was very very few penalties. So that's that's the system we're dealing with, and that's the system that we're trying to to fight and make much more humane. Time for a brief introduction to the Australian Unemployed Workers Union. So we formed in early 2014 and when we formed we became the only national organisation that was by the unemployed and for the unemployed, which is something that's very, very important to us, that the unemployed work unemployed workers actually represent themselves and are not represented by other bodies because as we've seen throughout Australian history, other people have, have come in in policy debates and acted as if they know what's good for unemployed people without actually giving unemployed people a voice. So giving unemployed people a voice has been one of the key aims of, of um, the Unemployed Workers Union, giving unemployed workers uh, a way to influence government policy so the mistakes of the past aren't just continued again and again. So that, that's essentially one of the big aims, is just to em empower unemployed workers so they have a platform that can influence um, government policy and hopefully um, better the positions of unemployed and in improve the, the, the types of policies that, that governments have been adopting when it comes to unemployed. So the difficult question that we had as a national organisation that was just starting out is how do we do this? How do we empower unemployed workers? How do we make a more humane system? And we looked around and we saw that there was a very, very complicated social security system that unemployed workers had to deal with, a very, very punitive Centrelink system. But when we looked at some of the the services on offer, we saw that there was a National Welfare Rights Network, which um, is a government-funded group that provides assistance to people dealing with Centrelink, but there was no such service um, for people dealing with job agencies at all. So we decided, well, that's a huge mistake, and a, it's actually an attack, really, on unemployed people where they're not given any assistance dealing with a very, very complicated employment services industry, which is a ten billion dollar or at least a ten billion dollar industry which has thousands of pages of guidelines but there's no actual help for unemployed workers dealing with this system so we thought well this is a key area of abuse that's going on and as we talked to more and more unemployed workers we saw that this was a huge area that needed work and unemployed workers needed some uh, you know support dealing with this this terrible system. So we decided to, to found our advocacy service and that was done um, November 2015. That followed um, our booklet, the Unemployed Workers Rights Guide, which had been available since earlier in the year, which was our first attempt to try to summarise what people's rights are under the system, under the Job Active system firstly. And that got quite a lot of interest from our members and at that point we, we um, we realised that we'd struck a chord with unemployed workers and we dedicated ourselves further to, to understanding how the employment services industry worked. And since then, we've been constantly editing and researching how employment services works in Australia. We've combined new sections into our unemployed workers' rights guides and the disability employment service. We're currently looking into the community development program, which is the the very, very punitive program that occurs up into the, the the remote areas of the country. And we're going to be adding a section to our Unemployed Workers' Rights Guide about that quite soon. So you can sort of get a general picture of what the Australian Unemployed Workers' Union is about. We're trying to give a platform to unemployed workers to fight back against the punitive system. And the way we're doing that is through um, our advocacy service, essentially. And one of the big goals of our advocacy service isn't just to help people, but also to try to collect data from the experiences of people to essentially build a report that we'll try to make um, sort of by mid next year that will create a full picture about what's going on in the employment services industry 
and what needs to be changed. So that's a really important thing to remember is that everyone who calls the hotline, they're not just empowering themselves and getting help um, in their dealings with employment services, they're also actually providing us with data that we will then use to lobby both sides of politics to get them to fix the broken punitive employment services industry. And that, that data that we get um, isn't just from the hotline either, it's also from the emails that, that we we answer through our advocacy services and also just through our general surveys and people coming and telling us their stories um, on our website. So now you've got an idea of the sort of work the Australian Employed Workers Union does. I just want to give you a brief idea of what we're trying to do in the future. Now this is a list of our demands and as you can see it's a, it's a pretty comprehensive list of of what we want to see happen in the, the welfare system and also what we want to see happen in, in the labour market. So we want to see all, all payments raised to the poverty lines, every payment is below the poverty line currently, work for the dole abolished, um, end discrimination against Centrelink recipients, which includes income management and various other discriminatory programs, remove, remove punitive eligibility for Centrelink payments. This also includes mutual obligation. We think mutual obligation is a completely broken system that we want completely abolished. And also we want to see the Commonwealth Employment Services reinstated, which was the state-run um, employment services system that existed prior to 1997, but, but that at that point it was privatised by the Howard government. So we want the employment, the, the privatised employment services industry shut down and replaced with a government-run uh, and owned um, employment service system. On the fair work side, we, we want widespread job creation programs. We, as, as I was explaining earlier, there are around 17, 18 job seekers competing for every job vacancy. So it's a structural problem, unemployment, and the government needs to take responsibility for that. We want secure work, um, minimum wages across all workplaces. We want the, the working week reduced, so Australians are working less, and then there's more work to go around currently because we can see at the moment that there's just lots of Australians working longer and longer and fewer jobs so if we see those jobs actually um, the amount of hours decrease then you'll it'll make more opportunities for other people to get work and then finally um, want the retirement age lowered to 60. Um, so there's sort of long-term goals as you can see a lot of them are quite ambitious so we've also got a just got a list of our short-term goals that we're trying to accomplish in hopefully the the next few few years, which is essentially a, a more of an agenda of reforming what we see as the most um, horrible aspects of the job agency system and the social security system, and thirdly, um, expose more broadly the unemployment crisis and demand decent job creation. So there are three short-term goals that we hope to be we're, we're working on currently, and we will be working on more over the next few years, with the hope of leading towards chipping away at those other demands that I mentioned earlier. So just to summarise our, our overall strategy here is um, we want to increase our membership um, by offering people a really, really helpful service um, in their dealings with job agencies, informing about their rights. And in the process of doing that, we want to empower unemployed workers so they become activists and they start fighting for their rights and dignity within this punitive system. And hopefully leading to its complete overthrow. And then we have our data collection, which is a really, really important part of our ongoing mission to fight for a more humane system. One of the problems with trying to get a better system and get unemployed to be treated better is that when we come forward with stories of abuse and unemployed workers being abused by private-run job agencies, is that the government can dismiss those stories and say it's just a rotten apple, it's just a case of one badly performing job agency and they'll take step to make sure that job agency doesn't do that again. What we need to do is give a complete picture of how the whole system is completely broken. It's not just a case of a few rotten apples, it's the whole tree that is rotten and that's what we're going to be trying to do with our data collection. Collecting these stories, putting into a report that we'll be releasing next year and then hopefully we'll be able to go around to policymakers and politicians and really, really hammer home this point that the job agency system is broken and it needs to be completely overhauled. And then our third 
component of our strategy is getting media on board, giving them these stories that people are having and trying to lift this lift a lid on this punitive industry. And hopefully in that process we can build allies and continue with our lobbying work. Now I think we should go into a little bit of a analysis of how we got to where we are today in Australia. Why this inhumane approach towards unemployed workers and, and social security recipients generally? I think this is a very, very important question, one that's often ignored, and I think it's really helpful to keep that in focus when we're doing this advocacy work and we can understand the role that the Unemployed Workers Union is playing historically and why this work is so important. So I'm just going to very briefly go through some of the key facts that have led Australia to taking this, this particularly punitive approach towards unemployed workers. So the first thing to think about is the history of unemployment in this country. So what this graph shows, and it's something that seems to have been forgotten in, in Australia, is that between the years about 1942 and 1974, we had what was called full employment in this country, where unemployment averaged about 2%. And this low unemployment was a product of the commitment of the government of the day to create jobs for everybody. And this is something that was expressed very clearly in the 1945 White Paper on Full Employment, a very famous document which for the first time outlined an Australian government's commitment to creating jobs for everybody. And this, I think, is one of the worst kept secrets in Australian history, that we had this 30-year period of full employment which was created as a result of a commitment by the government to create jobs for everybody. And it shows that a society like that is possible. And I just selected a quote here from that 1945 white paper, which I think gives a good idea of, of what the government's approach was to unemployment. The white paper states, the maintenance of conditions which will make full employment possible is an obligation owed to the people of Australia by Commonwealth and state governments. Strand governments will have to accept new responsibilities and to exercise new functions, and there will need to be the closest collaboration between them. Unemployment is an evil, from the effects of which no class in the community and no state in the Commonwealth can hope to escape, unless concerted action is taken. What a quote. It just outlines how the government looked at unemployment. It wasn't an was individual problem. It wasn't a product of individual failure. It was something the whole society had to take responsibility for. While there was quite a lot of support for full employment from Australian workers, um, it was clear from the beginning that business hated it. This boils down to what I call the golden rule of the labour market. This rule essentially is that the more unemployed people there are competing for jobs, the easier it is for the boss to dictate terms to workers. After all, when workers are desperate for work, they are more likely to accept low wages and conditions. Essentially, the more people there are competing for jobs, the stronger the position of the boss. So when the Australian government decided to introduce full employment in 1945, they, elim they eliminated one of the most important tools used by bosses to exert its power over the workplace. And this is the threat of unemployment. This perspective was often seen in the press in Australia during the full employment period, and I've got a couple of examples here of this perspective being made, made public. The first example is from the Sydney Morning Herald, and this is a quote from 1945, which says, The plain truth is that in a labour market which favours the seller of services, workers have become less inclined to exert themselves. They have lost fear of unemployment, and generally speaking, no other adequate stimulus to steady conscientious effort has replaced that economic spur. Another quote here from the Institute of Public Affairs, 1949 says, full employment is working badly because labour is operating in a seller's market and taking advantages of that situation. So you can get a real idea here of a, of a struggle going on. On one side there's the workers who wanted full employment in order to give themselves strong bargaining position over the boss. And on the other hand, there was the boss and business which wanted high unemployment in order to give themselves a strong bargaining position over workers at the work site. So this struggle is ongoing. And during the full employment period for 30 years, workers were winning this struggle. 
As a result of the increased bargaining power that was given to workers during this full employment period, workers started making more money. Their wages were increasing, unions were getting stronger, and as a result, the slice of the pie that workers were getting, uh, the slice of the national income workers were getting, was increasing. And this is what this graph, graph shows here. The labour share of income was increasing quite sharply from 1960 to the mid-70s. And the mid-70s is where business fought back against the full employment period and demanded that the government stop creating jobs for everybody because their profit margins were being so badly affected by the increased strength of, of workers. And as a result, when full employment was abandoned by both sides of politics in 1975, there was a sharp decrease in the labour share of income. And this is very, very strongly related to that struggle that I mentioned earlier going on between labour and workers on the one hand who want full employment as it gives them a stronger bargaining position and business on the other hand which wants high unemployment which gives them a stronger bargaining position. By the mid-70s, labour had lost this struggle and business had succeeded in insisting that Australia be, become once again a high unemployment economy, which gives them more power to dictate terms to workers. And I've got a couple of quotes here that I think really flesh out what this sort of economy is like. And as you can see from this first quote from Karl Marx in 1861, it, it, this is a very, very old idea about how unemployment is used by business to strengthen its own position. And this quote, I think, is a short one, but a good one. Unemployment is a lever of capitalist accumulation, a condition of existence of the capitalist mode of production. It forms a disposable industrial reserve army that belongs to capital quite absolutely as if the latter had bred it at its own cost. So that was the position we we're in, in in the 1970s when business all of a sudden had that tool again. They could use unemployment to dictate terms to workers. And I think this, this second quote also is a really, really instructive um, summary of what this labour market looks like. Unemployment is not a mere accidental blemish in a private enterprise economy. On the contrary, it is part of the essential mechanism of the system and has a definite function to fulfil. The first function of unemployment, which has always existed in open or disguised form, remember this was written in 1943, before the full employment period, is that it maintains the authority of master over man. The master has normally been in a position to say, if you do not want the job, there are plenty of others who do. When the man can say, if you do not want to employ me, there are plenty of others who will, the situation is radically altered. So in 1975, the, the, the position changed drastically and the master became back in pa back in the position of authority where they could dictate terms. As a result of this huge shift, we saw just a monumental change in the labour market and in the wider society in Australia. So you can see from this graph about the rise and fall of union membership in Australia, how much of a catastrophic effect the abandonment of full employment had on the union movement. But also from this graph, you can see what a, quite a amazing um, effect the introduction of full employment had on the union movement. You can see from when full employment was introduced in about the mid-1940s, the um, density of union membership increased from roughly 45% to a peak of 60% in, in the mid-1970s. And then once full employment was abandoned and that power shifted back towards the boss, you can see what a catastrophic effect that has had on the union movement and union membership. And I should say that the abandonment of full employment was one of many effects, but it's a very, very important effect that I think has been really neglected in a lot of um, discussion around what's happening at the moment in the labour market and in the union movement. So another big effect of the abandonment of full employment was the, the, the reduction in real wage growth. So th this goes back to that previous graph I showed you about the 
labor shared income. But this just really hammers home that point that as, as soon as full employment was abandoned in 1975, wage growth stagnated. And you can see here what a catastrophic effect that had on the wage packets of, of workers. And that, that effect has been ongoing. And as you can see from this graph, at the moment in Australia, our real wage growth is actually declining, which means people are actually earning less money than they were before. And this happens when wages fail to keep up with inflation. And that's where the term real wages come from. It measures wages in relation to inflation. So I think it's pretty clear that workers benefit from a full employment economy. They get higher wages and they have stronger unions. Bosses, on the other hand, they benefit from a high unemployment economy because they pay less in wages and they don't have strong units to deal with. But now in Australia, we've had a high unemployment economy for almost, for, for, for almost 40 years, or longer than 40 years. But this isn't enough. Business want more than just a high unemployment economy now. They want a high unemployment economy in which the unemployed are being punished systematically. The more degrading and humiliating it is to be on the dole, the, the more willing unemployed people will be to accept really, really bad conditions and low wages. And that's what our job agency system is all about. It's about punishing unemployed people for being on the dole in order to force them into really, really bad jobs where they're not getting... You can start to see now why the government spend $11 billion on this employment services industry. It's such an important part of this labour market approach that the government have, which is to give bosses power on the side. They, this employment services industry is such an important cog in this machine because if it wasn't for the employment services industry, unemployed workers wouldn't be willing to work for these dodgy bosses. They would much rather be looking for other work where that they believe they would get respected. But because dealing with job agencies and Centrelink is such a horrific experience, people would rather work for a dodgy boss where they're getting badly treated, getting underpaid, because the reality is job agencies in Centrelink are so much worse. So that's what's happening here. And I think it's really important to see it in this way because the work we're doing at the Unemployed Workers Union supporting unemployed workers dealing with job agencies isn't just helping unemployed people, it's helping the entire working class. The entire working population of Australia needs to support unemployed people because every time an unemployed worker gets badly treated by a job agency, gets harassed or forced unfairly into work, onto work for the dole, the more likely it is that they're going to go out into the labour market and be willing to do the jobs that are already being done for less money. This is why our advocacy service is so important. We're on the front lines giving unemployed workers the information they need so they can fight back against job agencies that are just insisting on bullying them and penalising them and pushing them off benefits and forcing them into all sorts of horrible activities. We need to try to give unemployed workers a bit of breathing space so they can choose suitable work. They're not forced into horrible jobs where they're being paid below the minimum wage in these sort of cash in hand type situations where bosses are just ruling the roost over very, very vulnerable workers. And it's for this reason that I believe our advocacy work should be supported by every working person. Because the work we're doing is a really, really important part of resisting neoliberal attacks, resisting the power of business and the ability of business to exert its authority over working class people. So that, I think, gives a pretty good summary of the work we're doing and the historical overview that has led Australia to the position it is today. In the next video, I'm going to go into a bit more depth into the current employment services industry and the rights unemployed workers have in that system. See you then.